morning everyone a warm welcome to the this tuesday morning symbolizing the second day of the lockdown four myself mr kiran raikar chief librarian of bk birla college kalyan take the privilege of welcome and thank to all my digital peers for joining us from different states of the country for the first session of this national webinar knowledge series on hygiene reboot a step towards revival a warm welcome to all the dignitaries who have joined virtually dr harold dikosta president cyber security corporation and ceo intelligent portal security system dr narendra chandra sir director education bk dilla college kalyan dr avinash patil principal bk dilla college kalyan all vice principals my college and school colleagues and dear pan the present unprecedented times of covid 19 the world hygiene in all aspects has become more important than ever before covid 19 has emphasized to focus on we serious see focus on hygiene to defeat the corona virus this is of the town as a full post plus services including e learning e reading e bike and so on like Primary in the primary knowledge resource center. The main aim is to disseminate knowledge. With this aim, we started this knowledge series on hygiene to spread knowledge, spread disseminate information about hygiene, and the knowledge series with various perspectives, including physical, mental, spiritual, etc. To start with, what is most important, urgent need of the time is science. I am thankful. to my team and management our director dr narendra chandra sir our principal dr avinash patil sir dr neetu kapoor principal of bharat college badlapur bhushali kulkar librarian of bharat college badlapur for their encouragement and support throughout planning and execution of this webinar i now request our director sir dr narendra chandra sir to welcome and share his views about this lecture so please to our esteem ek ek minute sir khan dr harold de costa he has been a wonderful associate for me when we were at the university the university was suffering from exam crisis paper leakage at sector at that time we joined hands and started working on e delivery of question paper initially just two hour before paper is to be typed put on cd and then to be sent online and ultimately developed into a great system e delivery system of question paper just one hour before and since then he has been of great help and well wisher of ours i am very happy to extend a warm welcome to him today for this presentation i am told 1500 plus people will be listening to dr de costa a formal introduction will be given by ms smita gupta and also i will request dr avinash patel a brief about college also should be given the reason being the people from all over the country i also understand more than 150 people are attending they are out of maharashtra state so or many may not be from our own institution so they should also get a feel that what dk birla college is what is our management what are our strengths and we stand for values our management stands for great value system so that briefly also can be put before the participants by dr avinash pat maybe before we start the lecture 
Dr. DeCosta also, when the biodata will be presented, will come to know he himself is a renowned expert in the field of cyber security. He has established himself as a, you know, many, so many CPs, police official, top DG, judiciary, government machineries, they will depend on him to sort out or help in resolving the cases. We know cyber crime has increased many fold and in present situation further it has become more difficult. So we will be very happy to listen to him. I also extend my warm welcome. Welcome from our management, our chairman sir and all the esteemed management members, all BK Birla College family, to all the participants who are attending this program. They may be from Birla College or BK Birla College or they may be from other institutions. I'm sure many are from our BK Birla Public School, many are from Century on Management and many others. Warm welcome to all of you and we look forward to the presentation by Dr. DeCosta. Once again, Dr. DeCosta, hearty welcome to you and our best wishes. We move further. Uh, institution uh, by UGC and our science departments, uh, the five science departments like uh, chemistry, physics, botany, zoology and microbiology, they are under the star status of DBT and uh, three departments like uh, Department of Computer Science, Department of IT and Department of Mathematics, they are under the Star College Scheme of DBT. Today, we are very fortunate to have amongst us for this webinar series, Dr. Harold De Costa, President, Cyber Security Corporation and CEO of Intelligent Quotient Security System with us. His company has featured in top 10 cyber security companies in the country in matters related to cyber security, cyber forensics, and digital evidence according to IQSS, that is Institute for Quantitative Social Science, Harvard University, USA. He is an advisor for many law enforcement agencies and a senior trainer to judicial officers for cyber law, digital evidence, and cyber crime. He is also an international trainer on cybercrime investigation and digital forensics. He has worked on more than 4,000 cases of cybercrime from seven countries and trained more than 35,000 police officers and 3,000 judicial officers in cyber forensics, cyber law, digital evidence, and cybercrime investigation. He was also on the panel of Maharashtra Police Academy to develop curriculum and courseware on cyber crime and digital forensics for corporates. He was a research person in 17 international conferences and also part of Global Cyber Security Summit in India. He is a regular writer in leading newspaper and an expert in cyber security on various TV channels. He had the distinction to train uh, the Supreme Court, High Court and District Court judges on cyber forensics organized by National Judicial Academy for the countries like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. He has worked on cyber cases related to large government enterprises, multinational companies, banks, telecom, educa telecom education, media and family disputes, etc. He has practical exposure in capturing digital evidences related to banking frauds, data theft, software character assessment through Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, cyber terrorism, intellectual property rights. He was instrumental in developing and implementing the first e-delivery of question papers from Mumbai University. The system was widely appreciated and now is de facto in many universities in different states of the country. He has developed courseware and curriculum 
in cyber security for premium universities in the country. He is associated with National Judicial Academy, NIA, Maharashtra Police Academy, Goa Police, CID, Center for Police Research, Detective Training School, Maharashtra Intelligence Academy, and many organizations from other states of our country. He has co-authored 15 books in cyber security space. He has developed cyber compliance practices to large and medium scale corporates to eliminate data proliferation and maximize profits. He has featured in training senior officials from Reserve Bank of India and about 125 banks on cyber security compliance, audit and investigation of cases. We are fortunate to have such an eminent personality as a speaker with us today. I join in all my colleagues and once again extend a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Dr. Harold De Costa. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So finally, the time has now come for which we are eagerly waiting for. I now invite Dr. Harold De Costa, sir, to enlighten the participants and share his expertise on this topic. Dr. Harold De Costa, sir, we welcome you and the stage is yours, sir. Please. Thank you very much for the nice uh, introduction. I thank uh, BK Birla College. Especially, I thank uh, the director, uh, Naresh Chandra, sir, for uh, inviting me for this uh, program, for this session. Uh, old memories did sprung up. As uh, sir already said, 2012, when we were working on uh, delivery of the question paper and we were fighting for the system to come but then cumulatively as a team and of course by the backing of sir we were successful in setting up a good system that time it's been almost about eight years but then associations never die and uh, back again due to this uh, coronavirus era due to this pandemic got an opportunity once again to get connected to BK Birla College and uh, share with you and all the participants about the practices or the ill practices which have been there in the cyberspace today. My session, I will be trying to focus more on the practical case studies, practical case studies which had come to me in the last uh, 52, 53 days of this lockdown. I had about 94 cases coming to me. So I was doing my work, irrespective, there was a lockdown, but there are some certain fields where the work was still going online. We were one of them. I'm sure that in the last uh, 50, 52 days, nobody might have got a call from any of the internet service provider that do you want any server space? Do you want your domain name to be registered? Because the IT sector was busy working during this pandemic era. I'm sure during this pandemic era, the doctors, the nurses, the police officials, all were being super busy. Well, some of these segments went for a slowdown. But let me tell you, in every problem, there is a blessing. And today at this forum, when we talk about the digitization of the computerized systems, cyber security plays a very important role. Gone are the days when things used to be done manually, but today almost everything is done online and the last 50, 52 days has taught us more that we should be more focused on the digital space, the digital media, because without the digital space, we would be incomplete in today's era. So I will share with you some live practices, live case studies, and of course, I'm sure that there would be some students. There are a lot of uh, participants from the academics. So I'd like to also share that some of the opportunities which could be unveiled during this era of this coronavirus. That's, my, that's the slide. Well, the topic is very apt and it's on the cyber hygiene. Well, uh, 
my by my introduction already has been done so i'll just skip this slide but telling you that uh, today we are talking about swachh bharat abhiyan but unfortunately very few of us are on the roads we are sitting at home so in relation to the swachh bharat abhiyan i would say that we also require now swachh internet abhiyan on a day to day basis we have almost about uh, 3 to 3 and 1/2 crore emails going up on a day to day basis statistics have revealed that during this pandemic era almost about 5 billion whatsapp messages are been circulated on a day to day basis which means that the cyberspace today is filled up with lot of information but sad to say the many of these informations which have been percolated through this social media or the social networking sites many of them are found to be fake forged doesn't have any existence so on and so forth so i'll go ahead with this the topic about this cyber hygiene and of course technology will reboot our economy and how this technology can be used in a secured way such as the cyber criminals won't get a chance to attack the system steal data modify data assassinate characters spread spread rumors so on and so forth well i have taken some statistics between 2015 to 2019 in 2015 the total cyber security breaches which were reported to certain certain is a nodal agency for cyber security in india in the information technology act certain has got a special significance certain as an organization coming under the ministry of law it and technology is a nodal agency for all cyber security breaches to be recorded at their end and they provide some solutions guidelines as to how people or the citizens should not be victimized or shall not be victimized so in 2015 certain says that is computer emergency response team in means india in 2015 they had about they had uh, received about 49455 breaches well it went on increasing and in 2019 till october 2019 i'm talking about the cyber security breaches went up to almost 3 lakh 14000 so if you see there's almost about six and a half times more cyber security breaches which were been recorded these are just the recorded figures the actual figures could be slightly higher as what is been noted in this slide these cyber security breaches could be in terms of data theft in terms of malware attacks in terms of phishing attacks in terms of espionage of data so on and so forth which i will be throwing some light as i go ahead in this presentation well the cyber crime cases over a decade also has increased exponentially from in 2007 we had almost about 481 cyber crime cases reported all over india and the end of 2017 that's the figure i could get from the ncrb the national crime record bureau it's almost about 22000 cyber crimes which are registered which were registered in 2017 so from around 480 cyber crimes which were registered in 2007 in the last 10 years has seen a huge upsurge of the cyber crimes which have been registered let me tell you the figure what has been put up over here are just about the cyber crime cases which are reported the actual scenario could be different as what it has been presented because many a times cyber crimes doesn't get to be reported for reasons there could be plenty maybe unawareness among the people maybe people may not be aware that they have become a victim of cyber crime and when they have become a victim of cyber crime by the time they go ahead to put a complaint with the law enforcement agencies the time has gone so there are various reasons maybe lack of awareness lack of education under these scenarios the cyber crime cases don't get to be reported or registered but what i'm showing to you on the screen is the cyber crimes which have been reported in all over india well 
the two states which recently are occupying the number one and number two position is Maharashtra and Uttar Pradesh. Now in the last two, three years, if once Maharashtra is number one, Uttar Pradesh is number two, the next year Uttar Pradesh is number one and Maharashtra is number two. So what has happened is that the state which has got the huge influx of population has become the state where large cyber crime cases are being registered. So if you look on the slide, there's a huge uh, exponential rise as far as the cyber crime cases are being registered. I'm sure by 2099, this figure will be close to somewhere about 28 to 29,000 cyber crime cases which have been registered, if not more. But please make a note, these are just reported cyber crime. The actual figure could be slightly higher, which has been presented up. Well, what is why these cyber crimes have been increased? The cyber crimes have increased because there is an increased use of internet and uh, the increased use of internet has given the increased cyber crime cases well 2015 june 2019 june 2019 we had almost about 65 crore indians using internet well it's almost a year from that june 2019 we are shortly coming to june 2020 i'm sure that the number of users who are using internet in our country has crossed the figure of 70 crores and the last uh, couple of months i think uh, those who are not acquainted with internet got acquainted with internet because without internet life became a total helpless issue so the internet usage have increased drastically we are the second largest user of internet in the world the largest user of internet in the world is china followed very closely by India. In the coming two years, I won't be surprised that India shall be the largest user of internet in the world. Well, it's a good thing. But one thing which I would like to discuss with you in the coming slides, but just give you a little filler, is that many of the users of internet in our country are not aware that internet also has a dark side of the story. People get victimized, as I just said sometime before, because of unawareness, that's the highest on the category. Almost about 98% people in our country are not aware what cyber crime is, and therefore not aware how the securities could be implied when any cyber crime takes place. I would say prevention is better than cure. Let's not wait for the post-mortem to be done when we become a victim of cybercrime, but rather before becoming a victim of cybercrime, let us have these criminals lose the battle of hacking into our network, hacking into our systems, and therefore this space, the cyberspace could be a hygienic, clean space for doing digital transactions which are legal and lawful in nature. Well, the digital around the world in 2018, these are the world statistics. Well, in Jan 2018, world's population was almost about 7.59 billion, about 760 crores approximately. Well, there's a marginally increase now. Maybe we might have reached to about 780 to 785 crores now. But the other statistics, that is the internet users, the active social media users, the unique mobile users, the active mobile social users, these have increased exponentially. So you can take a 25% markup in each of these statistics which has been listed out. So in Jan 2018, we had about 400 crore internet users. You can jack up by 25% to say that we have almost about 500 crore internet users today all over the globe. Active social media users have also increased, well, with the coming of WhatsApp, the social media users have increased drastically. In our country, we have almost about 44 crore Indians today using WhatsApp. We are the largest user of WhatsApp in the world. We are the second largest user as far as the internet users are concerned. When you come to the unique mobile users, about 513 crores all over the world used the mobile phone. In Jan 2018, we have 
cross the 600 crore mark with india itself we have almost about 16 to 17% of the mobile users are in our country we are the second largest user of mobile phone in the world coming year or so won't be surprised that india shall take the top slot as far as the unique mobile users are concerned and the most important part the active mobile social users which are almost about 2.295 crores in jan 2018 crossed almost 360 crores as about the 2019 statistics but the active mobile social users highest is india well i am sure that in our country we have the largest user of whatsapp in the world the largest user of facebook in the world the second largest user of emails in the world the largest country as far as downloading apps in the world so in all this part we are either number 1 and number 2 and therefore i think the time has come that we should be in a position to use the cyberspace in a more diligent manner in a most lawful manner that this space is used for the betterment of the citizens betterment of the people betterment of the complete pe- betterment of the people all around the globe well all of these increase of the digital has given a increase to cyber crimes well when we talk about the cyber crimes the most generic definition of cyber crime is misuse of technology to do any unlawful activity so when technology has been misused to do any unlawful activity it is termed as cyber crime we stand in the top 5 nations as far as the cyber crime is concerned and therefore during this last couple of months of this lockdown almost couple of months of this lockdown the cyber crimes have surged very alarmingly in the last uh, couple of months all over the globe there were around 4 lakh threats of cyber crimes which took place and uh, we in india had a large brunt of these cyber crimes taking place which i'll be sharing with you in the coming slides well the highest scoring countries per category countries having the worst and the best cyber security practices well now i'll try to focus the highest scoring countries per category the highest percentage of mobile malware infections is bangladesh almost about one third of the population of the bangladeshi who are using mobile phones their mobile phones is infected with malwares a malware is a program which is a unauthorized program which sits on the on the user's device steals information modifies the data it also corrupts the data it acts like a spy giving the information to unauthorized people anywhere in the globe so the malware infections are highest in bangladesh i had the distinction i had the privilege to train the bangladeshi judges when they had come to our country under the directive of the national judicial academy so when i was talking to the bangladeshi judges they were surprised when i showed them some live demonstration that their mobile phone was switched off but still a message could get generated from their mobile phone from their number a whatsapp message could be generated from their number without they sending a whatsapp message to me they sent a message to me on my whatsapp well they sent i want to meet you well on my device it never came as i want to meet you it came as i want to kill you under this scenario the situation went up to an extent where they felt that this digi- digital technology is it for our betterment or is it for our doom well all technology is for our betterment the usage decides whether it is used for a constructive purpose or for a destructive norms the highest number of financial malware attacks happens to be germany well 3% of the users of internet in germany they have become the victims of the financial malware attacks well financial malware attacks could also be a phishing mail which comes to them as if their bank account shall be locked if they don't provide so and so informations some of them they pass this information thinking that this email has come from the bank but in return rather than getting that particular 
account to be secured, they lose money from their account. I have some interesting case studies in the coming slides where I will share with you what happened during this last 50-52 uh, days of lockdown, specifically talking to you about the cases happened recently in our country and some across the globe. The highest percentage of telnet attacks by originating country is China. Well, the remote access, the hacking, the percentage of the hacking as far as the country-wise is stands China, almost about 21%. The highest percentage of attacks by crypto miners is Uzbekistan, where about 14.2% of the users have become victim of crypto miners. When I talk about crypto miners, you have some digital currency such as Bitcoin, so on and so forth. So people have been attacked saying that, ke, you know, you invest in Bitcoins, saying that, ke, you know, this is one of those digital currency where you will get your money to be doubled, so on and so forth. There have been always also instances where emails have been coming to the users saying that what you are doing on your computer for the last three months, your whole browsing history is with me. And if you don't confide and pay me, say about India, say about the US dollars there, right? About 2000 US dollars through Bitcoin, then we will have this information to put up in the public domain, which may have a large impact on your personal public life together. The least prepared for cyber attacks is Vietnam. That's very surprising because in the media now you hear that most of the companies in China will be shifting their base either to Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, and of course to our country. But Vietnam is in the list as far as a country where most some of the operations or some of the companies will shift their base but beware it's a least prepared country as far as the cyber attack is concerned so i think today when any nation wants to have its base to be transferred from china for that matter it should also look on the preparedness of the cyber security of that country india has a better cyber security preventions as compared to Vietnam. So I am little bullish that most of the industries in China, if they get migrated, a large chunk of them will get migrated to India, therefore creating a lot of job opportunities, but especially creating a lot of job opportunities as far as the cyber security space is concerned. We require a tons of technical and legal experts in the cyber security space. The worst up-to-date legislation for cyber security is Algeria. Well, that is something which is a very remarkable point of view. Well, the cyber laws over there are not updated from time to time. Well, in our country also, the last time the updation in the IT Act 2000 took place was in 2008. It's almost coming to be 12 years. Technology has gone from one end to another end. So the need for updation in the law, in the legislation is very important. I'm sure that the last 50, 52, 53 days of this lockdown, the government may be taking a serious cognizance that the law has to be updated with the recent trends of the cyber security breaches which are taking place. Countries having worst and best cyber security practices, lowest scoring countries per category, lowest percentage of mobile malware infection, well, happens to be Japan. Only about 1.34% of the users they have been infected through any type of a malware infecting their mobile phone. Lowest number of financial malware attacks happens to be Ukraine, 0.3% of the users. Lowest percent of computer malware infections, well, happens to be Denmark, well, about 5.9%. Lowest percentage of telnet attacks, well, Sri Lanka is there, Uzbekistan and Algeria, well, they have the largest, uh, they have the lowest percentage as far as the remote access of their systems are concerned through telnet or through other apps or other techniques. The lowest percentage of attack by crypto miners happens to be Denmark, where only 0.61% of the users could be affected by this cryptocurrency fraud, so on and so forth. The best prepared for cyber attack is Singapore. Well, Singapore can happen a heaven for most of the organizations to set up a base because today countries which are having the best prepared for cyber attacks shall be shall be taken 
as those base for setting up their outlets. So Singapore holds a very good chance because uh, they have their cyber security practices by and far the best as compared to the rest part of the world. The most up-to-date legislation for cyber security is France, China, Russia and Germany where the laws are getting to be updated every now and then. And where the legislation has got the norms, where the cyber, cyber crimes are being taken, where you have got a provision for it in the IT Act, in, in their respective legislation of cyber law, where the persons can be punished for doing any wrongful activity, I'm sure the cyber crimes will get minimized. Well, the next part in terms of talking about these, the cyber crimes are concerned is, well, yes, it's yes. Well, now I'll come across the cyber crimes have risen amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, there's been a huge uh, rise of the cyber crimes during this COVID-19. There has been an influx of fake apps, domain names and websites which have been registered just during this COVID-19 pandemic. Why? To create fear among the general public and their search for information related to this pandemic. And companies across the globe are turning to work from home via the online medium. Well, these are the two factors. Why? the cyber crimes have increased in the last couple of months during this COVID-19 pandemic. Well, I had a, a case coming to me March 27, 28, just I think second or third day of the lockdown in our country where an entrepreneur uh, called me up and he said that he, he has been victimized. He has lost about 65 lakh rupees from his bank, from his account. I said, what happened? So he went on narrating to me that uh, he has his vendors all around the globe. So he has a vendor also in Singapore who is to supply the material to him. And based on that, the invoice would be sent to this company in Pune through online mode. And the payment also was done through online mode. So I said, what happened then? He said, all last three, four years, we have been doing this online payment. Everything was going on well. But last two days before, that is March 25th, 26th, roughly about, he said that he, I received a mail from my vendor in Singapore coming from his email ID, identical email ID. No single character in that email ID misplaced here and there. So I got an email from my vendor stating that I had dispatched to you the material. This time, when you are making the payment to me, don't make the payment to me on that bank account which you have with you before. There is some audit which is going for that bank account. So under this scenario, this time you make the payment on this bank account. And so the details of the bank account was given to this entrepreneur on his email ID. When he received the email, he quickly forwarded that email to his accounts guy and said, please transfer this, this amount of money, which was in Indian money, about 65 lakh rupees, transfer this money into so and so account to account of the vendor. And uh, beware, this time the account is changed. The account number is changed. So transfer in this account. Now the accounts guy got the instruction from his CEO, from the owner of the company. He immediately looked at the email, transferred the money into that account and 65 lakh rupees was transferred into some fictitious accounts. The next day, his vendor called him up and said, hey, I have yet to receive the payment for the last consignment which I've sent to you. He said, what are you talking about? I've already made the payment to you yesterday. He said, no, I've not yet received. Well, at that time, the analysis of that email was done 
from where that email came. The email ID was genuine, which belonged to the vendor's finance officer's email ID, but it was not sent by him. That email ID was spoofed. The organization or the customer in Pune never knew that this was a spoofed mail, thought that this was a genuine mail. The usual practices of making the payment was going on related to the so-called, you know, related to the so-called payments were being done online. And under this notice, he made the payment, but lost 65 lakh rupees in the whole gamut of this. What I mean to say is that we read in the books that change the passwords of the email ID every week, every 10 days, have the password of an email ID, which is characters, numeric, alphanumeric characters, special codes, character embedded together. Keep the passwords, which are about say 30, 25 to 30 in width. Keep changing the passwords from time to time. All this is written in the books. But let me tell you as a breaking news that just a mere knowing of the email ID to a hacker or to an authorized person, he did not know the password of your email ID and still can do or still can send an email from your email ID. The time has come that rather than knowing about the password policy, it is very important to know how to identify between a genuine mail and a spoofed mail. If this person was knowing, probably he would not have lost this large amount of money just by accepting what was given in that email. Well, I also received a case during this coronavirus pandemic from Saudi Arabia. A guy, an Indian, called me up and said, Ke, I have received an email from an unknown person whom I don't know. And he says to me that for the last three to four months, whatever websites I'm visiting, with whom I'm chatting, all my digital credentials, everything is with him. And so he's threatening me. He's telling me that you have watched some porn sites, adult sites. I will have this information to be uploaded in the public domain. If you don't pay me about 2000 US dollars through Bitcoin. And there a link was there. And a threat in that email was that if you don't pay me this money by tomorrow, your information of all the histories of all what you have done on your particular machine or on your system will be a public news. So I became very much jittery. He said, what is this all about? And then he called me up through a source and said, Ke, such and such thing has happened. He said that I'm not worried that my history is with him. I'm only worried that I work in a fairly big oil company in Saudi Arabia. And in my laptop, I have some confidential data regarding my clients, regarding my vendors, my customers, my company's data. I'm, I'm, I'm having a fear whether this data is gone to him. And if this data goes to him, my whole company's marketing business strategy will go in the public domain and which will harm my company some few millions of rupees, if not some billions of rupees. What I mean to say is that I was doing the analysis of this email and found that this was a spoofed mail, a fake mail, just trying to make this person to be afraid and therefore making money during this coronavirus pandemic era. Well, for some of them, making money during this era has become easier, but for most of them, making money or earning has become a difficult option. The second instance is the companies across the globe are turning to work from home via the online medium. Well, that has happened now. We are also working from home and so are our millions of people in our country today are working from home. Well, that's the only buzzword today is there. But then there was a report yesterday which was sent to me by one of a very senior person saying that we may have the world's worst cyber attack in the next six months or in the next coming six months, the world's, you know, the cyber attack 
could be there. The world's, you know, the most uh, dreaded cyber attack could be there. But many, many countries will be clueless and they will be eroding much of their economy going, just going everywhere. When I read in that report, one line which just touched me was that because of many of the people today are working from home, they may not be using the best cyber security practices. They may not be using a Wi-Fi, which may be an encrypted one. They may not have the best of the password to their Wi-Fi routers. And therefore, this becomes as a most important information for a hacker to get into the home-based Wi-Fi, to get into the machine of the user, and then have the data to be taken out, misuse that data, and maybe with that data create money for that hacker or for the criminal in an unauthorized manner and therefore creating a lot of economy loss to the company which has been working for years together to create a good name in the market. So the working from home has never been a secured way of doing it and that's why the next six months it is anticipated the world's biggest cyber attack may take place and it will hamper the whole world, not only one nation or two nations, it will hamper the whole world. Well, there have been instances where we saw a few years down the line, there was an, a virus which attacked, the, which attacked Iran and there were a lot of money which were being taken out from the Iranian country, from many of the big, big companies by turning their particular data into uh, opportunity for the hackers. So keeping our fingers crossed, it should not happen. But if it does happen, then I'm sure that the many, many of the cyber security specialist, cyber forensic specialist, cyber crime investigators would be required in the industry to ensure that such type of attacks are being minimized or they don't take place. Well, the phishing attacks have increased and margin very alarmingly increased that's not marginally but very alarmingly increased in the last couple of months what exactly phishing means a phishing denotes to the cyber term of luring and cheating an internet user through a fake sms or an email or through a whatsapp and thereby breaching their privacy to steal sensitive informations scamsters impersonate as hr department ceo or any other known person and target users by giving them fake offer letters. Well, during this time when it is anticipated that almost about uh, 71 to 72% of, uh, of our young generation people who are working in the industry for less than two years now are looking for a job change. They are looking for a job change because they are not confident enough that when this lockdown gets over, their company may retain them. And during these circumstances, they shall get a letter as if it is coming from an HR department, giving them some fake offer letters in return, asking them to, to deposit some little money such as they can get this offer letter and they can start working. Well, during this time, I urge that when any of the person gets a letter from any of the HR department, maybe from a small or a bigger company or a medium scale company, it's very important to talk to that company personally today on the, on your, through your phone or through your email, ask them whether it is sent by them before getting lured up to that fake offer letter, which is given by a scamster or given by a criminal. I had one case coming to me from, um, from one of the, one of the guy, he approached me during this pandemic era, he approached me and he said that he, he's got an offer letter from a very big builder, builder's company. And it said that he, you had uploaded your buy data on a portal, monster.com. And we have seen your credentials. We have seen your CV over there. So we don't require any type of a interview to be taken by you because you are a stalwart in your field. And therefore, an offer letter was sent to him. He was so happy. He said that, okay, look, in this time also, I'm getting an offer letter because I don't know the organization where I'm working now will accept me once this lockdown is over. 
he immediately got in touch with that agency which sent that fake offer letter via email and that agency said look you have to deposit about 50000 rupees in so and so account to ensure that ki all your process your verification check is done because now we cannot do lot of those checks because of this pandemic era so this much money you have to pay and you are there in that organization post this lockdown he paid that money but after paying that money he understood that he has become a victim of cyber crime when he spoke to that company when he spoke to that organization one of the most uh, uh, one of the big building uh, uh, builders in the country when he called up they said that ki you know thank you very much he said why he said i got an offer letter from you he said we have never sent any offer letter the letter which has got which you have received is not by us but sent to you by a scamster sent to you by a criminal and therefore we are not liable for this offer letter or the terms and conditions which are given in that the cyber mongers are targeting users to download apps telling them about the contacts contaminated with the deadly virus well this case happened in mumbai vibrating and therefore you will be aware now that you should be away from this area and so when he clicked on that particular app downloaded that app he made a payment for having that app to be installed that app turned to be a fake one not telling him anything but in return taking his particular personal sensitive information and therefore making him a victim today our government has made the arogya setu app i would urge that when you download this app always download this app from the government websites don't download apps, don't download this website from any play store for that matter because apps which are there on the play store they have never been audited they have never been checked i had lot of particular apps during this time of this corona virus and before also where these apps which was supposed to be doing good for the citizens for the people but in turn they were doing privacy breach getting an unauthorized access to the data and creating a fraud so if you want to install any app say for example arogya setu app go to the government websites only the government website will have a legal licensed authentic copy which you can download it which can help you out if there is any person nearby you who is contaminated with this deadly virus well for a minute i would like to ponder and also say to you is that when we are downloading apps from the internet almost 99% of the users never read the terms and conditions never read the privacy policy regarding that app we are in a race that who is the first one to download the app we never read what the privacy policy is and later on we say that we have become a victim of cyber crime at least in that whole privacy policy at least see for this three norms or these three points first one find out where the server is registered where all your data is stored point number 2 find the jurisdiction and last but not the least find out whether this app is secure well for all of these three things most of the apps they have their server located outside india jurisdiction follows of the country where the app is been made or registered and as far as the third point we don't know because there is no agency which checks for the compliance which checks for the security of the app before it is uploaded on a play store therefore if you get all of these three points checked to your satisfaction then go ahead in downloading the app there are many apps while downloading it asks your personal information it asks you to keep the location on of your device it asks you to keep the bluetooth on it asks you that i want to get uh, access to your contact book or your phone directory it asks you that i want to have uh, access of your various folders on your mobile phone on your device my question is that why all this accesses are required and people in our country download the apps because it's free of cost and anything which is free of cost 
we happen to be the first one in the queue to download it not knowing when there is any app which is free of cost we become the product for it our information recorded by that server becomes a money for that particular agency to sell that data and make the money today information has got a tremendous value and this information when it is being sold to a marketing agency for a money we think that we have got an app free from the internet but actually our information has bought the requisite money for that particular agency to ensure that his company is grows day by day there are many 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 organizations today whose business model is zero they give free apps they give free softwares but you see their market capitalization is in some billions of dollars how come it has happened because our information which they have taken while the app has been downloaded becomes a money monetary value for them so that they can make a money and the market capitalization goes on increasing beware next time whenever you download any app first find out whether there is a necessity for this app to be installed number 2 give only those particular privacy checks or privacy part which you feel you are comfortable to give it for example if you download a weather app the weather app will definitely ask you to share the location because it will ask it will then tell you what's the temperature at your locality at your end but if that same app is asking you to give the access of your contact book or your phone directory beware don't give it they don't have to do anything with my phone directory with my contacts because they are just a weather app telling me about the climatic conditions the weather conditions in the country around the globe in my locality so on and so forth so you have to be having a good cyber hygiene practice these cyber hygiene practice will ensure that tomorrow you and me don't become a target of these cyber criminals well the fake emails targeting users that their browsing habits are recorded and giving threats to make payments through bitcoins i all i shared with you a case which came to me from saudi arabia the analysis of that email revealed that it was a fake and a spoof mail but believe me he gave me at least 5 to 6 calls and said that i am under fear if the data from my laptop goes in the public domain my company shall fire me and once the company fires me in today's situation getting a job is extremely difficult when the cyber threats during the covid 19 the related threats in quarter 1 of 2020 well total spam messages related to covid 19 was 907k huge detected malware related to covid 19 713 malwares were detected malicious urls well 48000 fake websites were been registered and they were registered for to look as if it was for the betterment of the people but actually they were done or they were created with a malicious intention of making the people disguised in terms of giving them something it was actually taking there's a increase in spam from february to march 2020 exponentially 260% increase in malicious url hits from february to march 2020 well there's a 260% increase in the malicious url i'm saying that we should check the urls or the websites which are coming on through a whatsapp link most of this links could be a malicious link which could be taking us to an unwarranted websites and therefore creating a privacy breach in our mobile phone and also our data being accessed to put in the public domain without our information the country which has been the largest largest beneficiary of this covid 19 cyber attacks has been united states of india it's a top location for spam and malware detections and users accessing malicious urls the most superpower the biggest superpower of the nation has become the country where the large number of cyber attacks have taken place during the covid 19 pandemic well some preventions very important ignore calls asking you to divulge your bank and plastic card details when i say plastic card details it means your debit card credit card so on and so forth interestingly i just also wanted to share with you a case 
which came to me during this coronavirus era. A senior professor from one of the Maharashtra's largest and well-renowned state level academy, a government state level academy, she sent a, a WhatsApp message to me about say seven, eight days before. And when I read that message, I was taken aback. It said that having sessions on webinar is an offense, or through webinar is an offense. Now that particular message was pasted on the backdrop of an Ajtak screen, Ajtak channel screen, to show it was a live message being broadcasted on the Ajtak TV channel. Well, that message formed three-fourth of the TV screen and the one-fourth of the screen had the photograph of our Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi. If a common person looks at this image which has come on his WhatsApp, he shall take that as a gospel truth and say, oh, having sessions through webinar is an offense and they had written the section also under 498 of the Indian Penal Code, which is a Domestic Violence Act. Now, when she sent to me, actually at that time I was having my dinner, but then while having my dinner also I get cases. So I looked into it. I thought that this is more important from my dinner because I never wanted this message to get viral. And so immediately I checked for that authenticity of that image and I saw through a forensic administration, I saw that this was a nicely crafted photoshopped image pasted on the backdrop of an Ajtak screen to show as if it has come on an Ajtak TV channel. And when there is a photograph of an honorable PM, people will take it as a gospel truth. Oh, this is the new law which has happened and we should not having sessions through webinar because it is an offense. But it took me about 10 to 15 minutes because of the cases which I handle in this area and immediately I sent my opinion, my observations to her saying that, no, no, this is a fake message. But in the 15 minutes, she had already sent this message to 10 of our other groups. And most of the groups happens to be senior government officials. She said that, thank you very much. But in this last 15 minutes, I've already forwarded to 10 more other groups. I said, now you, send this message to 10 other groups, to all those groups saying that this is a fake message. But the question is that when this message was broadcasted by her to 10 other groups, God knows in that 15 minutes, those people have forwarded to how many people? It might have reached some millions of people maybe in that 15 minutes down the line because WhatsApp is so fast. It's so electronically fast, electrifying speed that in 15 minutes, the whole of a nation may come to know what is happening good, bad, so on and so forth. What I mean to say is that when you get any message on WhatsApp, especially when it is related to law, when it is related to the coronavirus, please go on the government websites, check for the authenticity of it before we become like a glorified clerk, just transferring or transmitting that message as if we were the first one to do it, helping the people during this time. 83% of the messages which come on WhatsApp are found to be fake. That's why the world's topmost fake university now is WhatsApp. WhatsApp was made for a good purpose, but today it has been used for a reason where the bad is more and the good is less. Well, a suggestion to all my participants is that as far as possible, don't share any official personal information through WhatsApp. WhatsApp is a wire media by which you share some pleasantry messages. Don't share your confidential, private, personal, bank related data on these websites, on these through the social networking app through WhatsApp because you could be a victim of it. Correspondingly, calls coming as if it is coming from a bank that your card shall be blocked. If you don't give this information to us, it's all fake. No bank will ever give a call to its customer asking for the credit card or the debit card details, which includes their card number, CVV number, 
OTP number, so on and so forth. So when you get such type of a calls, ignore it and tell as many people as you can because in today's era, you may not be able to help out people physically, but at least you can help them out virtually, such as their particular money could be protected because the financial crisis may go to a large extent once this lockdown is over. People may not be having money to buy essential items and therefore I think it becomes a prime responsibility if we are knowing to share this knowledge to the masses such as they don't get to be victimized. Especially our senior citizens have to be knowing about this because they may get calls saying that Ki, your card shall be blocked and in a matter of a fright thinking that Ki, the hard earned money will be lost. Actually, the hard earned money will be lost because their debit card is blocked or they, they are not able to withdraw the money. But in turn, the money will be going out from their account which may create a lot of financial crisis, especially to the senior citizens. Well, don't, don't, don't download apps from unauthentic websites. Well, that's the unauthentic websites. You can, you know, install paid antivirus to ensure that fake and malicious websites are alerted to the user. Well, paid antivirus is a must. Nice, must. In fact, uh, when you talk about the fake and malicious websites, if your mobile is infected with some certain malware, please ensure that key. Please ensure that it is a paid antivirus is installed in your mobile phone. I want to share with you one case. If your mobile phone is not protected, your confidential information can go to a third person without knowing, without you knowing, key, your mobile is being compromised. Cyber trespassing is one of the offense. And when you talk about uh, cyber. Uh, trespassing. I can tell you, I had a, a incidents, a very famous media person who was with me in one of the conference. Well, we were in Goa that time having a conference where we had the senior judicial officers, the senior law enforcement agencies were there with us. So three days program. I had the session on the very first day itself before lunch. He had the session post lunch. And uh, he comes from the media field. I come from the security field. So we became good friends. And in the evening, uh, on the evening, we both were strolling on the side of a beach in Goa, the Kalamgut beach. First test conference was over. So we were just talking. In the meantime, his phone started to buzz. As soon as his phone started to buzz, he ran away almost about 400 to 500 meters. He picked up his call came back to me where I was in the next five to seven minutes. And he told me, sorry. I said, it's okay. No harm. He said, uh, I had a call. I said, it's okay. I know that the phone was buzzing. He said, you may be thinking that why I ran. Back of the mind, I was thinking. But then it was not my particular question to ask him. It's his own call. He said, look, I ran because that call was from my wife. Then I became a little in inquisitive. He said, look, when I came for this conference to Goa, I told my wife that I'm going to Ahmedabad for the conference, but in turn, I came to Goa for the conference. So I said, how will your wife would know where you are? First and foremost, why did you say that? He said that, look, if I told my wife that I'm coming to Goa for the conference, she would have asked me 101 questions and my conference would have been done at home itself. So I just had a little hearty laugh. And then he said that, okay, I ran because if I would have picked up the call while we were strolling on the side of a beach, the slight sound of the wave of the sea would have triggered my wife's brain 500 kilometers away and she would then know that I am somewhere near a seashore and then she would ask me 101 questions once I return home. He also went on saying, probably casually maybe, he said, my wife is Sherlock Holmes version 6.0. We had a little hearty laugh third day, on the third day, the conference got over. He went back to Mumbai. I came back to Pune. Very next day in the morning, at about 7.30, he called me up and he said, breaking news. I said, what happened? He said, my wife came to know that I had gone to go for the conference. I said, look, you are such a big top media person. Two possibilities come to my mind. One possibility is that your photo during the conference might have become viral. It might have reached your your wife's mobile device, where then she would know that you are there in Goa for the conference or 
your boarding pass, which will be there in your in your shirt, in your trousers pocket. She might have got that particular boarding pass, and from there she came to know that you are in Goa. He said, "No, I have a fair and a better practice for the last ten odd years. That before I come out of the airport, I tear my boarding pass into three, four pieces, throw it inside the dustbin, and then I come out." Then I thought that he. His wife could be really Sherlock Holmes version 6.0, and then he told me, "Look, my wife gifted me a mobile phone three and a half months before, and while she gifted me, she said, 'From today onwards, you shall use only this mobile phone. And if you don't use this mobile phone, I will consider that you don't love me.' And so he started using the mobile phone, which his wife had given to him, not knowing. that is why fat hidden a app a app inside a mobile phone which could give this complete information about his whereabouts about the chats what he would do about the calls he would receive the calls he would make about the location so on and so forth he said from yesterday 10:30 night when i reached home till today morning 6 o'clock she took all the three and half months history and for each of those questions she asked me my answer was yes 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 I wouldn't say no because all my digital footprints were there in her custody in her mobile phone. I said during the last three and a half months, do I mean to say that this is the first time that you have come to a place without telling her that you are going to X place and you came to Y place? He said no. This is the third time which I have told that I'll go to the X place, but I went to a Y place. i said why during the two times she did not caution you alert you he said probably i feel the first 3 months were my probation period she thought something here and there it's okay but after my probation period got over she felt still i am not improving me and yesterday she caught me and from 10:30 night till morning 6 o'clock all the history she was she took from a mobile phone and she placed in front of me asking me questions well it is a real case it's not something which i have created it it is a case which i'm sharing with you because it may be possible that our mobile phone today which we have got might have been infected with a malware with a spyware please have your mobile phone to be installed with a good quality and paid antivirus paid antivirus not a free antivirus and once you use a free antivirus you never know your free antivirus could itself be be a malware could be a spyware because the liability of that particular threat doesn't doesn't is not there on that particular manufacturer of that app or the developer of that app but only when you buy a app a buy a antivirus and still if your mobile phone is been hacked or if the data is goes to a third party then you can catch hold of that service provider or that manufacturer of that app who has made it so interesting case study but worth worth knowing about it i am sure that all the men's participants who are there at this part may be in a zippy now to check whether the mobile phone is infected with any malware and i am sure that all the women in the group today may be happy there is something by which the check or a monitoring could be done across i am just talking in a in a in a hearty manner but at the same time passing a message to you also that if any unknown person has installed any such app in your mobile phone and it has come to your notice it is a cognizable offense the complaint has to be registered up to 1 crore rupees is the penalty to the person who has installed such a such a malware or such a spyware in your system please uh, for for married men women among yourself it's not an offense so far as that you are having on the same wavelength but if there is any dispute between the husband and wife and if the matter is in the court during this time if any of the party has installed such type of a app to get the information from the user or from the other partner then in that case it happens to be a cognizable offense download apps only which are required and don't share personal and sensitive information while installing the apps please be cautious what what type of a privileges you give to a person to give to the app while the information while the app is been installed at your end 
Well, the few of the slides, since I am talking, I believe to most of the participants who are there from the uh, who are there from the education sector. Just two three slides to tell you about the demand for the cyber security professionals is huge. Well, just as a business might hire security, even when there's a local police force, so must a business hire cyber security staff. We have a police force. That doesn't mean that more police force shall not be hired. Police force shall be hired in more quantum because the crimes are increasing, the jurisdictions are increasing, the locations are increasing, so on and so forth. It is ultimately the duty of the organization to protect the proprietary data as well as any customer information they are privy to. Last year, NASCOM reported that India alone would require 1 million cyber security professionals by 2020. I would also like to add on that our Honorable IT and the Law Minister during the India Mobile Congress, which happened in our country in October 2019, also said that by the year 2025, India would require at least 5 million cyber security professionals, which means that this is one of the field which is already up and will be growing higher up in the days to come out. So good news in this era when, when we find that people are losing jobs, there is a sector where the jobs are increasing and would be increased exponentially as the days proceed. The job portal indeed reported a spike of 150% in cybersecurity roles between January 2017 and March 2018. So huge, huge influx of cybersecurity professionals and the companies have doubled the size of their cybersecurity teams in the recent years. Well, the credentials and the growth required education today high school diploma also can do because the shortage of people is there. People are using technology, not knowing how to secure it. Well, where we have got security, people are unaware how to use that security practices, where we have security in place, but then the hackers are more intelligent than us, 10 steps ahead than us, how to break into the security. So you require people not necessary only with high glorified degrees or qualifications, a high school diploma also can do, provided that person is practically competent enough to get, to get the skills to secure the organization as well as people who are using the digital technology. The projected job growth between 2016 to 2026 is 28% for information security analysts, 7% for police and detectives, 11% for private detectives and investigators. This source is from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. Well, this will be little higher now. This during this coronavirus era, I'm sure this particular figure might have been slightly changed. Maybe another 10 to 12 percent could be higher in terms of the projected job growth because this was from 2016 to 2026. So the statistics are slightly old. Nobody thought that such coronavirus will affect the whole all around the globe. So all of these figures, I am sure that you can inflate it minimum by 10 to 15 percent more people would be required. The median annual salary, well, 2018 was $98,350 for information security analyst, $63,380 US dollar for police and detectives, $50,090 US dollars for private detectives and investigators. A good, good salary for people who are there in this field. Well, for students, specific from our, from our domain, from our country, the cyber security specialist happens to be one of the job which is now getting a lot of momentum. What are the things involved in this? OS hardening, building best security practices, monitoring threats, mitigating threats and risk assessment plan, and granting roles and responsibilities to users and data mining. Well, that's most important role which today it has played. We have seen Geo, how it has happened. Reliance has sold some part of its stake to Facebook. It has sold some part of the stake to other US company. Why these, why these companies are investing money in, in Reliance? Because they know that data has got value. The information has got value. But when the information is there, you require data mining. People also who are part of the cybersecurity specialist to ensure that the data is been properly mined, properly secured, and doesn't go to a third party 
for and doesn't go to an unauthorized third party. Network security engineer. Well, from the day when I came into this field, network security engineer was there. Now also, it is one of the evergreen field. Well, to ensure the security systems are implemented, response include maintaining the systems, identifying the vulnerability and improving the automation, oversee the maintenance of firewalls, routers, switches, so on and so forth. And the salary of a network security engineer begins somewhere between 4 lakhs and can go up to 8 lakhs per annum. Good opportunity for student in today's era. The 4 lakhs rupees per annum also is a sizable money during this pandemic. The cyber security analyst, well, huge, huge potential in this also. Well, the job is monitoring, planning, implementation, upgrading the security measures, conducting the vulnerability testing, risk analysis, security assessment, managing the network, salary around 6 lakhs per annum, a decent salary for a cyber security analyst. A security architect, well, is a little higher job, a middle management level job, but the salary is up to 17 lakhs per annum. Of course, the qualification for this will be the high amount of experience which would be required. Well, this, this uh, job would require design the network and computer security architecture, planning, research and designing, company policies to be developed, procedures for how their company's employees should use the security system. This is what is happening up. Most of the security architect today are designing the system, how their employees could work from home and what type of a security system should be planted into their laptop or into their digital device. And the average pay for a security architect begins at a whooping 17 lakhs per annum, 1.5 lakhs per month is a very, very decent salary for a security architect professional. The cyber security manager, well, this is one more particular job opportunities which is getting, which is already got created, but this will be on the higher flux. Salary is very decent, up to 1 lakh rupees a month. One or two years of experience would be required to come, to come into this particular domain, into this particular sector. The CISO, well, that's a topmost, one of the topmost posts in the cyber security domain. The salary is anywhere between 2 crores to 4 crores per annum. This could be more during this time because you have very less CISO and the CISO today has to play a very big role because the digital environment today has become too much clumsy and therefore to ensure that this digital media works in the requisite norms as far as the organization requirement, the CISO plays a very important role. He has to liaison with the staff to identify, develop, implement and maintain process, responding to incidents and set up appropriate standards and controls to mitigate the security risk without causing any interruption to the business, responsible for overseeing the implementation of security policies and procedures within the organization. Well, this is something I wanted to share. I know that my subject was cyber hygiene and I wanted to share with share these things also because there may be some, some of them who may be looking eagerly what are the new opportunities. There will be some senior professors, lecturers who are a part of this group trying to figure it out what exactly the, the career they can give to the students. I would also urge that courses related to cyber security should be a mandatory program now because this is the one field which is going to increase exponentially in the days to come. Before I take a leap from here, I just wanted to come back to my topic of the cyber hygiene for the next five to 10 minutes. And then I will keep this forum open for the questions which you can ask me. The first and foremost, let me come back to the favorite topic of this social media. And the social media, I'm sure most of you will be there on Facebook. And I'm sure that while you are there on Facebook, most of you might not be aware that who are your friends and who are not your friends on Facebook. When you added a friend on your Facebook account, you may not know the identity of that person because he may be your friend's friend and therefore you may not be aware who he or she is. But what is the guarantee that that person who is there in your friend book list may be one of those persons who is looking at your information and then misusing it for a cause. I can share it with you, some of the incidences where the friends in Facebook have turned to be foes. 
there are many rackets job rackets which are fake rackets which are being run people who are having their profile on facebook having friends on their facebook not knowing them but then the information what you upload becomes a big fodder for these cyber criminals to attack you on the grounds of the facebook most of the time we find that people they put their photographs especially women you have to be cautious 72% of the victims of social media crimes happen to be women and therefore you have to be cautious just to ensure that when you upload your photographs be cautious because your photograph is now going in a public domain there are lot many tools which are available freely on the internet which can download that photograph morph that photograph upload that photograph in some unforeseen websites in some pornographic websites and create a personal and a professional loss to that person therefore the best way is that it's always better that don't upload your photograph as your dp well if you are a known person you may have to upload because otherwise also people will just search you on the internet and get it but those who are not a public figures please ensure that ki your dp should be not your personal photographs not your personal image and specifically to women and to girls who may be there a part of this webinar number 2 i think today please go and check that how many friends you know on facebook that's a exercise of a good cyber hygiene and i'm telling you when you will be going through all your friend list 70% of them minimum would be those whom you don't know please take them out otherwise they will become a big headache for you in the days to come when they will be a part of some organized gang or organized group giving your information to a third party and committing a crime number 3 while you are there on any social networking site or an app specifically now i'm talking about the facebook please don't give your personal information on facebook on your profile my name is so and so i studied from this college now i'm teaching in so and so college i'm staying at so and so place why do you require to upload this information on a public domain the friends who wanted to know you will know you anyhow but when you are putting this information there's always a element of risk because the other person will start profiling you know about you and this information later can become an important fodder for that person to commit a crime against you i can tell you about an incidents where a proud father had uploaded the image of his son on facebook with awards what he received from a school and writing from this school so and so forth the net result was that he put that information on the facebook page as a proud father telling many of them of his friends that look my son has made me so proud but the net result was that the criminals looked at this information came to know that this child studies in so and so school and the child got kidnapped because the criminals got oh he studies in same the school studies in so and so class they kept kept a eye on that particular child and the net result was that because of this information which was uploaded on facebook by the proud father it resulted in the kidnapping of that small kid what i mean to say that while you disseminate any type of photographs any type of videos through facebook or any social media site please be cautious the whole world is looking at you and another important fact is that today even if you delete your profile from any of the social networking sites today even if you delete your chat from any of the social networking site that chat is not erased once data is created on the digital space it is permanent we come in this universe we live in this universe we die but our digital footprints will never never erase from the digital space or to that matter from the cyber space why i am telling you this why i am more focusing on this because today the cyber space is not properly guarded we don't have proper cyber jurisdiction in place and therefore under this scenario 
it's very difficult to catch hold about the criminal if he is from outside our country. To give you an example, he may be sitting somewhere in US, hacking or committing a crime against a person in India, using an app which is registered in Germany and using a network or a technology which belongs to a person who is from Russia, whom all the law enforcement agency can catch, which jurisdiction they shall follow, how they will follow. And when we go to the police registering with a complaint, many of the cases, the complaints what we registered is registered, but the catching a hacker becomes impossible because the servers are located outside India. The hacker is located outside India and getting all the systems in place becomes a big, big Herculean task. And during this two months of this coronavirus, the police are protecting us by being out. I think it's the time now for us that we should have proper cyber hygiene practices in place with us to ensure that what we type, what we chat, what we upload on the social media space should be as per the privacy norms. I will not share any personal photograph on the social media if I am not a public figure. Number two, I will not chat with any unknown persons whom I don't know. Number three, I will go away from uploading any of my personal information today on any of the social networking apps. And number four, I should know the laws which are prevailing in the country before I start using any of the social networking apps or for that social media for that matter. Well, I wanted to press upon this because today the cyberspace the servers on internet are filled all with garbage. Tomorrow it may happen that this server may get crashed because so much of data we are churning, so much of data we are creating it. And all this data we are creating it for no reasons. Take an example of WhatsApp. Right from morning 5, 5.30 till evening 11, 11.30, most of us are there on WhatsApp. I remember the statistics which was given by our honorable Minister of IT, Law and Justice, Mr. Ravi Shankar Prasadji, during the India Mobile Congress, he said that in October 2019, he said that the average time an Indian spends on its mobile phone, on social networking sites, is about 3 hours 47 minutes. And now, I think during this pandemic, I am sure that it might have crossed 6 hours, or maybe more than that. Because I can see sometime the last time when a person was there on a WhatsApp, the last seen time is 2 a.m., 2.30 a.m., 1.30 a.m. Because our whole habit of our sleeping habits have changed, our eating habits have changed. And for us, our mobile phone, our internet has become next to God. I think it's not next to God. For some of them, it has become primarily more important than God. If internet is not working, I think the whole world will come to a stand still. Last but not the least, when I'm talking to you about the WhatsApp, many of us feel that WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted. Well, on technical grounds, yes. But just what I shared to you sometime before, a message which came to me, which came, which was, which came from a user's number XYZ. He just typed on his device, I want to meet you on my device, it came as I want to kill you. I had this live presentation done in one of the CBI conference when I was teaching the CBI officers. Well, a debate came that WhatsApp is encrypted, end-to-end -end encrypted. So I said to one of the officers that, why don't you ping me? I want to meet you. And so he pinged me, I want to meet you. By the time it reached my device, it came, I want to kill you. He said, how this has happened? I said, technically, what WhatsApp may be saying, it is end-to-end -end encrypted is correct. But from a legal perspective, it has got a drawbacks. The reason is very simple, because we have some mobile phones today. There are two categories of mobile phones. One is a rooted mobile phone, and second is an unrooted mobile phone. I want, to, I want you to ponder on this. If your mobile phone is rooted, which means that the messages which come on your mobile phone can be modified. 
and if your mobile phone is unrooted then the messages which come on your particular whatsapp number they will not be modified they will not be changed now the question which comes up over here is that how to know whether my mobile phone is rooted or unrooted well there are some certain apps by which you can install the apps to check one of the app which comes to my mind is root check you can install this app in your mobile phone to check whether your mobile phone is rooted or unrooted if your mobile phone shows it takes about less than a minute to check whether your mobile phone is rooted or unrooted if the final analysis while this app is working in your mobile phone says that your mobile phone is unrooted which means that messages which come on to your device they may not be modified but if it is shows it is rooted then there is a possibility that once the message is rooted from a whatsapp server it can be changed on the local device to prove that the message what you have received is not the same which has been sent by that person and let me also tell you in many of the cases after months together or after few days we delete the chats but if a person really wants to have some crime to be done he may store some of the message and at a later date he may modify selective messages to show to the people that this is what you chatted with him at so and so date at so and so time let me tell you these digital evidence once it is presented in the to the law enforcement agencies it becomes as an admissible evidence how to prove the authenticity is now the question for the police as also for the individuals and that's why i said install a root checker app which can tell you most of the information whether your mobile phone is secure or it is unsecured all said and done please don't unroot your mobile phone because if your mobile phone mobile phone can be unrooted if it is unrooted then the warranty of that mobile phone is over but today criminals they hardly care for the warranty point of view because if they want to do a mischief monger they can do such type of a tricks and put a put a law abiding person into a big problem and last but not the least that's the question on which i will now end my session who owns the internet well there is no owner of internet and that's why when i was talking to you about this cyberspace it's very important to know that there is no owner of internet you and me are using internet at our own risk but that doesn't mean that there is no particular organization which has a control over the internet control over the internet in terms of the domain names which are registered with them but there is no owner of internet if you google it and check at your respective web on your mobile phone you'll be surprised to know that there is no owner of internet internet was a concept in 1994 internet came in our country it's 26 years now that internet is there in our country but i think i have revealed a breaking news that after 26 years down the line most of us might have realized that there is no owner of internet and that's why making this cyberspace a secured one is our own cumulative responsibility we cannot rely that google is the owner of internet we cannot rely microsoft is the owner of internet no none of them is the owner of internet internet is uh there is a body where this body is governed by members from each nation they form the policies and guidelines but once again the question comes as far as the implementation of these policies and guidelines well for a country like us which has a population of almost 130 crores or 1.3 billion we require a data privacy or a data security policy to come immediately otherwise since there is no owner of internet people may get victimized and that should not happen at any cost in a remote remote dream itself i think i have shared with you most of the things right from your social networking habits to also telling you about the phishing mails to also telling you that whatsapp legally 
is no more encrypted technically yes but it can be used as a primary evidence where convictions or acquittal can take place depending upon what type of evidence is being produced in front of the court today the court also has got a large bearing that to identify that particular message is genuine or fake before coming into the conclusion of the matter and last but not the least i am also a uh, academic person by heart even though i am there into the sector in the corporate working very closely with the law enforcement agencies also giving my suggestions my view point to the judicial officers of the country and to the various government organization but my mind still is like an academic person and i think that we all together should use this particular internet as a more safe secure place and we have been revealed now it's been revealed now that cyberspace jurisdiction is a big problem no single owner of internet and therefore it becomes our prime responsibility to make this space secure safe and reliable i am winding up my presentation i am getting ready if there are any questions which you have from me and if you have a question you are most welcome to ask me i thank you very much for all the participants who are there at this time watching this presentation this webinar from whichever part of the world i thank you for your time for your graceful time that you were there for the last one and half hours listening to me you have any suggestions you have any questions please you can ask me now thank you very much then uh, dr harold costa sir to speak us today on this very evergreen topic of cyber hygiene which is the need of the hour uh, sir the session was very excellent uh, in terms of your content uh, you covered and the presentation was you made i thank you sir for accepting the invitation uh now we shall start with the question and answer session there are many questions and doubts from the participants uh which we have received on the question answer uh, chat box but due to the paucity of time we will not be able to take all the questions so we'll be selecting the questions and i now request uh, ms swapna nikale to read a few selected questions swapna please thank you sir it was indeed a wonderful session uh, we have been flooded with more, more questions through the participants so some of the questions has been selected and uh, similar questions have been uh, combined together so the first question from a participant is uh, nowadays we are attending many online webinars fdps quizzes and we are filling google forms is that information safe anybody can misuse this information or what what is your suggestion sir okay that is a very good question uh i did try to answer this question before you upload any data on internet three things are very important please check out where the server is located number 2 the jurisdiction and number 3 whether that site where you are uploading the data is secure or not and now i think i can add point number 4 into that because very shortly we may also have the uh, data privacy bill also in place in our country at the fourth point is right to get a data back because once you give your data whether you will get the data back these are the four points but answering to your question very specific i would say that ki rather than uploading the data on to a server which is located outside india i think it is a time for us to develop our own system wherein the data can be there within our country i am sure that in a laughing in a just in a hearty way uh, khana swadeshi pina swadeshi rehna swadeshi this is what baba ramdev says so uh, if anybody knows baba ramdev i am a huge fan of yoga of him you can please put a question to him that server cup swadeshi hoga and i'm sure that baba ramdev will take this and uh, probably have a patanjali server coming in few days down the line but back to your question on uploading your data on google drive well conditions apply there is an amount of threat 
only upload data which is not so much confidential maybe your name maybe your uh, uh, email id uh, well you also have to put up your mobile number also but if the terms and conditions of that service provider says that they won't divulge this information to any third party go ahead but still the question mark still arise whether they follow it or not it's a big question because even if you catch hold of them they say that ki your jurisdiction the jurisdiction is not india you have to follow the jurisdiction of that country from where that app is been made but answer our own server i think in the days to come we may have to come to ensure that your question is completely answered thank you sir yes uh, the next question is from uh, anand uh, asked by many participants the question is related to credit card cloning and debit card cloning how exactly we can protect ourselves from these kind of cloning mechanisms well uh, the cloning uh, of cards have minimized to a large extent now to a large extent i would not say completely but to a large extent they have minimized the reasons being uh, you see your credit and your debit cards they have a they are chip enabled and once they have a chip enabled on your card the card details are not taken out so easily because the hackers would require little sophisticated technology to get the data from your card so the concept of a card cloning to a large extent has been minimized now i would say that rather than your card cloning i think we should have a better cyber hygiene practices to be followed as not to share our data of our card to any third party number 1 number 2 while we go to a shopping mall while we go to any public place while we give this card please ensure that ki the pin number what you enter that should be entered by keeping your fingers on that particular pos top of that device i've seen many many users who when they enter the pin number they are not cautious at all they enter the pin number as if the whole world should know about it the cameras are there on that mall anyway now the malls are not working so i may be talking about a history but whenever they get open you should be cautious to this fact is that when you are when you are entering the pin number please ensure that there is no camera which has been there on the top of that particular place where you are entering the pin number number 3 and the most important part what i want to reveal now is that the cards which you have a debit card for example are international debit cards if you have a international debit cards these cards are prone for more type of attacks than compared to a card which is used only in the national perimetric geography now how it is so if you have a international debit card written on your debit card itself on the top of your debit card god forbid if your card details are being compromised compromised means all these card details are written on your card huh? that is your card number name of the person to whom that card belongs cvv number and the expiry date assuming that let's say you go to a petrol pump you give the card to that person who fills that petrol pump suppose he takes the image of the front panel and the back panel of your card and gives this particular data to a third person who is sitting somewhere outside our country maybe sitting say somewhere in nigeria china wherever it is outside our country now that person in turn can go to a online shopping portal which is registered outside india following the jurisdiction norms of that country and can say buy any of the electronic device or any any thing for that matter and while the payment option goes he may use your particular card details that is your card number name cvv number and expiry date and don't be surprised that being a international debit card in many instances it won't ask for the pin number nor an otp shall be asked i think you should be very cautious that when you have a international debit card the first thing what you should do is that go to that banking site whichever your card belongs to and then you will have options now that you may have to talk to your banker there will there are options wherein you can make your international debit card to work only in the national perimetric that is only in india 
and not outside India. So tomorrow, even if at all, these card details, which are there printed on your card, goes to a third person. He cannot commit any type of an online transactions through these details, simply because the moment you have made your card to be used only in the national geographic parameter, either a PIN number or a OTP is a must. And if that person is not knowing the PIN number or the OTP, no transactions can take place. I think these things you should follow. And the other important part is the contactless cards. I think we are having contactless cards today where you have got the Wi-Fi enabled. Please be cautious. Up to 2,000 rupees, the money could be debited from your card without the OTP or without the so-called PIN number. So the contactless cards, use it minimizely or even if you use it, use it. But please ensure that it is not being stolen. So don't don't think much of cloning. If you follow these practices, I'm sure that most of us shall not be victimized of this credit and this debit card frauds. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is a question from Mr. Navid Patel. What kind of internet service can we go for since there are many private agencies providing Wi-Fi services? And what precautions we should ask for? Well, when you are having any services, let's say you are taking any type of a inter internet connection from any of the service providers for that matter. The first thing is that what the default default password, what you have assigned to the router by the person coming from that agency has to be changed immediately by you, not in front of him, but only you should be able to know what is the password. You should ask that particular service provider who is providing you this internet facilities whether the password is encrypted or whether it is in a decrypted form. Number three, you should always ensure that the password you should keep on changing from every now and then. Number four, you should always also sign when you are, when you are installing any type of internet gateways at your home or at your office. You will be given some form, the terms and conditions. Please read that terms and condition. Ask questions if you have before you sign that particular terms and conditions form and give it to that particular person. Last but not the least, always ensure that if you are having any type of a internet service to be taken in your office, please ensure that the server is localized and it is available within the Indian jurisdiction following the Indian norms. If you follow these practices with that internet service provider or with that mobile service provider, the chances of you getting to be victimized as a for a cyber crime shall be minimized. I won't say completely you will not be victimized, but you will not be victimized to a large extent. These practices you have to follow. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, one more question is how we can select the best antiviruses? What are the parameters we have to look while selecting an antivirus? Uh, I am little sorry to say about this, but then I have to say because as a professional, I have to be authentic to each and everything what I speak. You should always look for an antivirus which is globally recognized. That's the first one. Number two, as what I said to you, if you are looking for an antivirus which is globally recognized, then by default, it may conclude that this server is outside India. No, there are many antivirus today who are global players, but they have got their servers placed within India. So first and foremost, go for an antivirus, which is a global antivirus because they keep on updating the uh, patches. They keep on updating the so-called the threats so that you don't become victimized from time to time. Number two, check where the server is. If you are looking for a global antivirus where the server is outside India, please don't go for it. But most of the global anti, uh, antivirus service providers today have got the servers within India. If it is so, go for it. Number three, when you talk about an antivirus, also be cautious to that fact. Ki that antivirus gives you the latest updates and you also install the latest updates from time to time. I have seen many of the time, uh, many people have got the best of the antivirus, but they don't update the patches from time to time. I bought an antivirus today. After six months, I update the patches. No, the patches should be updated on a day-to-day -day basis. 
parameter basis. So whenever there is a new patch which comes from that from that anti antivirus service provider, keep on updating that particular patches. If you follow these practices, once again, I would say to a large extent, you won't be victimized. There is no other, uh, I would say, any rocket science or any Herculean terms and conditions which you may have to look other than these basic parameters as a user. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, one last question. Uh, the question is from Mr. Prasad from Ganshanda Suraf College. Sir, is it possible that I click on an unknown email and my data from laptop gets transferred? Uh, rather than clicking on a rather than clicking on an unknown email, I would say that clicking on an unknown site link. If you click on an a phishing site link. Under that, presume, if you click on, say, for example, www.google.com, that's the authentic website of google.com. But there may be some website which may be www.g00gl.com. So for the eyes, when we look across, it looks Google only. But actually, it is not G-O-O. It is g00gle.com. So if you go on this site, click on this particular link, then the chances of your data going to this particular server cannot be ruled out. Yes. Thank you, sir. It was indeed very resourceful session. You have cleared very much doubts which we had. Uh, over to you, Kiran, sir. Once again, thank you, sir, for uh, very useful tips. And uh, thank you, Sopna, for taking up the questions. I know uh, the participants have posted many questions, but uh, due to the post, uh, scarcity of time, we cannot take all the questions right now. But we'll get back to you, sir, again for the some few questions and for the doubts get clear for the participants. Uh, so we have come to the concluding part of this webinar session. Uh, I now request uh, Ms. Smita, Madam, to deliver the oath of thanks. Ismita, madam, over to you. Thank you, Kiran, sir. Good afternoon, all. Gratitude is highest among all the altitude. On behalf of BK Birla College of Arts, Science and Commerce, I take this opportunity to propose vote of thanks to those who have directly and indirectly contributed to this webinar on cyber hygiene, which was organized by BK Birla College Central Library, Knowledge Resource Center, Department of Information Technology and Department of Computer Science. At the outset, I thank our resource person, Dr. Herold de Costa. He enlightened us on cyber hygiene with many real life examples and told about various cyber crime consequences across the globe. He also shared his experiences on the lack of user awareness about the internet, cyber laws and risk, posing a big challenge in India. We are really enlightened with your knowledge and presence, sir. We are thankful to our Honorable Director, Dr. Naresh Chandra, sir, our Principal, Dr. Avinash Patil, and our management for their esteemed motivation and enthusiastic support. A special thanks to the organizing committee for their unflinching support and coordination. A heartfelt thanks to all our participants for their involvement with us in this webinar. With these warm words and a kind message, we move to the end of today's webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. All of you will be getting the in your respective email inbox within a period of one week. You have some time. After you fill the feedback form, we will be receiving the certificates in your emails and finally i take this opportunity to announce that in a next few days this webinar series is not complete in the next few days we'll be coming back again with a new aspect and perspective of hygiene of this national webinar knowledge series of hygiene reboot a step towards revival and i hope a similar response from all of you so don't leave the telegram group and stay connected so I finally say that in this COVID-19 period, all of you should stay home, stay safe. Thank you one and all for this session.
for participating in this session. Thank you.